<laughs> the bad boy. He tells us to shower the people we love with love. But God doesn't want that. <laughs> God wants us to shower everybody with love. Even the people that don't like us. Even, 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 even our enemies. What, what if for God so loved the world? It really is true. And it is. Uh, uh, uh. That would mean it's true for our enemies too. Jonah was a prophet, Old Testament prophet, a man of God. He heard from God. He preached. Uh, uh, but he had a problem with the fact that God loved the world. <laughs> he had a problem with it. Let me tell you why he had a problem with the fact that God loved the world. Because he did. He, he had been imbued by extreme patriotism. Jonah was cool with, with enclave evangelism, but he wasn't cool with enemy evangelism. My mic working? Yeah. And here's the problem that's still true in the church today. We got the people we like, and we will shower them with love. But let just let a Muslim walk through that door. Y'all, well, I'm, I'm sweet good. Yeah. I, I didn't plan a church so we could just love some folk. That would be dominate. This stuff, this stuff is too hard. So, if it's still true today, we need to walk through this book, don't we? <laughs> what I want you to do in the next, I don't know, eight weeks or so, I want you to answer the question, am I willing to love everybody? <laughs> am I willing to evangelize anybody? Am I willing to go globally? I said globally, globally. Maybe, maybe that means the Middle East. Uh, or it could just mean the dude across the street from you. Father, speak to us. I done messed up and said the word Muslim in here. But I know you love everybody. So don't, don't let me punk out now. I done said it. I need you to show up. We need you to show up. We need you to have your way. So I decrease. I beg you to increase. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Holy Spirit, do what I cannot do. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Kevin Turner read the three verses. It's only three verses. Uh, uh, but that's enough. It's enough. He read the three verses, but can I just kind of explain them to you real quickly? Uh, it's kind of my intro. In verse 1, in verse 1, all you need to know is that God sends a word. That's all you need to know. Jonah the prophet chilling, maxing and relaxing, shooting some b-ball outside of the street. <laughs> Jonah is chilling, and God gives him a word. I'm a preacher, and if there's one thing I need, is a word. <laughs> I don't need to go on the internet and get it. I don't need to Google somebody else's sermon. I need to sit my butt down and hear a word. <laughs> oh, it excites me that Jonah got a word. His girlfriend ain't the one giving him a word. It ain't his homeboy calling. It ain't his mama them. It's God, the one who created heaven, is speaking. The one who spoke the Pacific and the uh, Atlantic and Kennesaw Mountain, yes. Yes. <laughs> speaking. God, God, God is speaking. 
Don't let us be a church that takes for granted when God speaks. No, man. Don't take for granted when you can bow on your little knee and hear from God. Don't take it for granted that we ain't scared that somebody going to come up in here and shoot us or arrest us for having church. Hey, hey, by the way, if you hear from God even now, it's okay to lift your hand. Worship team ain't got to be singing. He heard from God. (laughs) But now if I hear from God, Marcus, I ain't worried about nothing. He heard from God. Everybody loves, what, what have you always heard preached when you hear Jonah? It's the same thing. No disrespect. It's about that doggone fish. I get that. That's the big miracle that everybody preaches about. Jonah being in the belly of, some folks say it's a whale. Other folks, mm-hmm. Anyway, he's in, he's in a fish. That's the mind-blowing miracle to most people. To me, when I read the text, I'm just reading three verses. The mind-blowing miracle to me is God would send a word to a hard-headed man. That's the miracle. (laughs) I guess I can relate to it. I ain't never liked Jonah in Sunday school as a kid. Because God telling you to do something, you ain't doing it. And then I started studying the text, and God's like, Keith. That's been you. (laughs) What I love about God is he knows Jonah's going to be hard-headed. He knows everything. What I love about him is he doesn't say, you know what, I ain't going to waste my time with him. Anybody glad God ain't got that attitude? (laughs) I hate to admit this, Emmett, God ain't like me. If I think you're wasting my time, I'm through with you. God ain't like me. God ain't like me. God spoke to him anyway, knowing he was going to be hard-headed. Verse 1 is all about a word coming down. It says that now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of yes, saying, Amatai. I don't know how to pronounce it. (laughs) Second thing that I see in the text, uh, uh, what is the word? Let me just tell you, God wanted enemy evangelism. That's verse 2. I want you to go and evangelize your enemy. Look at what he says. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. In other words, that wickedness is so big, it's swelling up. It's coming up all up in my face. I see it. And I I don't want to slay them. I want to save them. (laughs) So, 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 so I'm going to need you, Mr. Preacher, to do some enemy evangelism. Yeah. Who are you to evangelize? The enemy. Who, who's the enemy? Nineveh. Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh. The capital of Assyria. Anybody ever read the Old Testament? You already know this. If you ever see Assyria, that ain't a good thing. Assyria come to stomp you out. They come to take you captive. Assyria, that's who I want you to preach to. You know Assyria, the ones that worship the god Asher. And they worship several other gods and goddesses. Go preach to them. Assyria, you know Syria, uh, they have legendary brutality. Legendary cruelty. Go preach to them. Uh, uh, You know Assyria, the ones that impale their enemies on stakes. Go tell them they living in sin. <laughs> Assyria, the one that, that hang uh, uh, people's heads in trees. Go tell them they wrong. Go tell them how about their wickedness. <laughs> the, ones, the, the ones that would burn their captives at the stake, play skulls. They would just pile up skulls. Go preach to them. Uh, don't tell them about the name and claim it stuff. Tell them they living in sin. But really underneath what he's saying, you can miss it. You can miss in verse 2. He says, arise, go to Nineveh. What is he ultimately saying? Can I show you? He's saying, hey, partner with me in ministry. That's what he's saying. (laughs) Partner with me. 
I ain't sending you to a mega church. I ain't sending you to a place that's going to have you a summer house. Go to Denver. But you get to partner with me. <laughs> uh, here's the problem. Jonah has a message kind of mercy. Here's what I've learned from Jonah. It's true of us too. Often when others get mercy, we get mad. I don't know, Jonah didn't say anything. He doesn't say anything in these three verses. I'm just talking about us. Uh, we don't want mercy for other people. I don't want to be a part of mercy for a doggone Muslim. I don't want to be a part of mercy for my ex. I don't want to be a part of mercy for my backstabbing, conniving, uh, 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 scandalous, trifling co-worker. I don't want to be a, 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 a picture of mercy for that lady who stole my man. She stole. How you steal a man? Man, I'm 175, 76 pounds. It's hard to steal me. Maybe he just wanted. How you preach to a lady that got your man? How you want her to get to heaven? So I want you to see what Jonah is dealing with. Here's the thing. I didn't say this the first service. Jonah is called to preach to people that have heard him in the past. That's hard enough. Anybody in here ever been abused? I got to preach to somebody who hurt me in the past. Here's what I didn't say. But they're going to hurt you in the future too. Would you share the gospel with somebody you know going to hurt you in two weeks? <laughs> My mic, right? <laughs> See, I don't want us to play church. I don't want that. I'd rather die. I'd rather die. I don't want you coming here feeling good every week when your cousins and your, your co-workers that hate you, you hating them back? Are you kidding me? You hating gay people. Boy, it's quiet. <laughs> can't hate anybody. Oh, do we agree on that? God has a purpose for Jonah. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> but preachers, here's what we be wanting. We be wanting the purpose like down by the beach. Get that, give me that church down by the beach. That's the kind of purpose we want in America today. Give me a purpose that's going to give me a Cadillac. Right, come on, come on, come on, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody ever have a problem with God's purpose? Because you have a problem with the people in the purpose? You could do the purpose if he take the people out. You know, if he just threw it out there, love folks. <laughs> he tell you to love that neighbor that don't keep their yard up. And you trying to get yard up. You know what I mean? Come on, sir. He'll tell you, love the person that abused you. Go evangelize your enemies. That's verse 2. Then verse 3. Verse 3 uh, reads, but Jonah. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything else. <laughs> Go preach to your enemies, but Jonah. <laughs> Go evangelize the people that's been hurting y'all, but Jonah. Go evangelize the people that in a few years, they're going to hurt you again. But Jonah, that's all you need to know. All I know already, he ain't do it. Right, 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 right. It says, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. Where? From the presence of the Lord. I said at the first service, how do you run away from God's presence? <laughs> Because see, if I end up right here, he, he hears, so what am I do? I'm trying, what am I doing? What am I doing? You see how stupid we are? Because Jonah ain't the only one. Man, I run from God's presence when I know I want to do my own thing. And I'm hiding, I'm hiding, I'm hiding. And he right there. 
He rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down. The Bible is brilliantly written. Don't miss that. I'd underline. He went down. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he what? Paid the fare. Mm -hmm. And went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Again, the first two words tell you all you need to know. But Jonah, but Jonah, but Jonah. Hey, Jonah said no. Now, you don't see him speak, do you? He doesn't really actually say it with his lips, uh, uh, but he says it with his life. I got two kids. Kids know how to talk without talking. Cut the grass. That's a no. Anybody in here married? You, you, you know your spouse can give you a no without saying anything. You ever touch that leg in the bed? And that leg moves? That's a, you're going to have a bad night. <laughs> I thank God for small beds. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. <laughs> Y'all crazy. Let me ask you a question now. The laughter is about to stop now. My question is this. How does your no to God look? Jonah said no. He never used his lips. But his life was saying no. How do you disguise your no to God? How do you fix up your no? Here's what I've learned from working in churches over 20-something years. Church people, they disguise they know this way. Let me pray about it. Seven, seven years ago, God told you what he wanted you to do. You still praying. You're saying no. How do you disguise your no to God? You really got to get this. Because saying no to God changes your life. So, I'm happily married. 48 years old, not a boy anymore. But I ain't always been married. I used to be single. And I used to live here in Atlanta for a season. I call it my season of sin. <laughs> Atlanta is a good place. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing it. It's a good place to sin. It's a good place to sin. It's a good place to sin. When I lived here in 91, 92, uh, I was a part of a hip-hop group. I've shared this before called the Brothers of Nature. We used to wear fishing hats and fishing gear and hunting gear. We were all black wearing hunting and fishing stuff. <laughs> How many of you know we didn't get that record, dear? But here's, I guess you can call it a benefit. Our manager was a partner in a club called the Phoenix Club. Yeah, you can clap. I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. I'm clapping with you. The Phoenix Club, tell me if I'm lying. Now stop me. Uh, it was the hottest hip-hop club in Atlanta. It was the hottest. I remember back then, 91, 92, jump around. I jump around. I remember. I remember Dawes Effects. Crisscross. Jump. Jump. So I was in the club about twice a week. Because, see, I knew I would be a preacher. I needed experience. <laughs> see, if you ain't never lived it, how can you preach it? <laughs> And so this one night, I was always the designated driver, man. They're, the guys in the group, they would, they would be putting them down. And I was the designated driver. It was about 2 a.m. And, and we were going home, me and the main rapper. I was driving. We're walking out of the door. I'm taking him somewhere he ain't got no business going. 
I'm going to drive in there. And we get to the door. And as we get into the door, three beautiful young ladies, they coming in. So immediately I realized I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> and I turned around and I followed them. And the prettiest of the young ladies, I started throwing my game to her. I was throwing my best to her, and, and, and God was moving. She was throwing it back. <laughs> I was single. I ain't always been up here preaching. Y'all looking at me funny. Make it real. Some of y'all were in the club last night. But I began to mack to her. I remember her name. I won't say it. She was from Houston. She had an engagement ring. She said she was engaged. And I'm thinking, but you talk like you talking back to me. This thing looking good. And, 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 and I, I was very arrogant. I wrote my number down on a napkin from the bar. I, like I'm doing her a favor. I said, hey, call me tomorrow. She took that number, put it in her pocket. We kept talking. And then Cypress Hill, jump around, came on. And she said, hey, let's go out here and dance. Well, I can't dance. <laughs> and she went to the dance floor, never to be seen again. I got home the next day at about 5 or 6 p.m. And I, uh, that's before cell phones. And I asked my roommate, I said, hey, has such and such called me? He said, no, nobody has called you. So back in the day, you had this little white box of caller ID. I look, I scroll. Yeah. <laughs> that was 1992. <sighs> 1992, the summer, she didn't call. The fall, she didn't call. <laughs> uh, uh, winter, she didn't call. <sighs> she didn't call at all. She didn't call at all. Uh, now, she never said no with her lips. Matter of fact, matter of fact, she was talking game too. Uh, but she gave me a no. No means no. But what does it mean when you say I'm going to call and you don't call? Can I tell you what it means? Still no. <laughs> And still no, I can fix it up all I want. I'm a fool if I think otherwise. It's a no. I'm a fool if I think just because she was nice to me, she was just disguising her no. And she had the weirdest name in the world that it hit me this morning. It probably wasn't her name. <laughs> to know. Never with her lips, but with her life. I'm going to ask you again, how does your no look to God? Wow. You think you slicking God? Ooh. You told him you would call. You told him you would be there. You told him if he saved your, 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 your family, you would serve him. Jesus. And we too scared to say no with the discourse we do it with our lives. I'm going to beg you to identify how you know that God looks. I'm begging you because it wrecks your life. Y'all looking happy up in here. Some of y'all's lives are wrecked. And we don't want that. So say yes. How does, how does your no look? You got to identify so you can rectify. Number one, you got to find out how your no look. Why? Because it's disobedient. Old school word. It's disobedience. Uh, you can disobey without ever saying the word no. Why? Because at the root of disobedience is pride. Breeding a power struggle with God himself. <laughs> Jonah was fleeing. And that's what the Bible says. He's fleeing. But can I submit to you? He is engaging in a power struggle. It just looks like running. Jonah is on a boat. Can I suggest to you, it ain't a cruise, it's a power struggle. He's going to Joppa when he should have been going to Nineveh. That's a power struggle. <laughs> the very fact that God allows us to have power struggles with him is grace. Y'all ought to thank him for his grace. 
Got two children. Talk about them a lot. You've heard me talk about them. Got my son. Got a daughter who's 19 in college. Beautiful girl. Petite, hundred and something pounds little. She lived under my roof for 17 years. And twice in 17 years, she engaged in a power struggle with me. One time we're eating dinner that I paid for. She's eating and she stood up over me, over me and challenged me. Happened twice. Yeah, I got a house just like y'all. <laughs> The fact that she's alive today, <laughs> great. The fact that she can walk without a shoe sticking out of her, it ain't nothing but great. <laughs> See, Jonah ain't the only one that's told God no. You Sitting up in here today, sitting all in the middle of grace. I always hated Jonah and God showed me, Keith, you've engaged in power struggles with me. I've told you to do some things and you procrastinated. You disguised your no. And it's disobedience. <laughs> Moved here in 2003 to work at a church. Things didn't work out there. I was there for six months. I was there for five months, 30 days too long. And, and when I quit that job, couldn't find a job, man. It was hard to find a job. I finally got a minimum wage job working third shift. Hated it. Didn't like it. But God can use anything. Yeah. See, when I had to get training on that job two weeks, they trained me on every shift. And I can remember when I did the second shift training, there was an older black lady who wasn't highly educated, couldn't really put a noun and a verb together, but she was an evangelist. <laughs> she was like a lady from Elberton, like from my hometown. Couldn't put a noun and a verb together, but the spirit was just on her. And, and she heard that I was in ministry, and she came to me and said, hey, don't know what provoked this. She says, hey, son, I hear you in ministry. Let me tell you something. If God tell you to go in the house and fry some chicken but you go outside and plant some flowers you been disobedient that was 2003 I ain't never forgot that you know how many bible classes I sat in I forgot stuff I've never forgotten that she broke it down elementary school if I go in the house if he want me to fry this breast this neck this wing this back and I go, you mean, you mean planting some daffodils can be engaging in a power struggle with God? Yeah. yeah. You mean planting some roses can amount to a power struggle with God? Yes. Do you mean praying when God told you to be doing? <laughs> can amount to a power struggle with God? Yes. Do you mean writing a check to people in Africa when he told your butt to go? I want us to look at ourselves. The next eight weeks, what does your no look like? If you're not doing it his way, it's disobedience. Why the power struggle? I'm about to move on to my next point. Why, why the power struggle? <laughs> I texted some of my preacher friends and asked them, why, why the power struggle? Uh, I heard words like, well, prejudice. Makes sense. I heard words like racist. Makes sense. I heard words like fear. I would be fearful. God sending me to preach a hard message to people who kill people. That's like going to Nino Brown saying, hey, man, you can't sell drugs here. <laughs> Fear. But, but one of the things that I thought, I'm not trying to disrespect God. It just seems like what God suggests or directs is crazy. I'm sorry. And I'm not trying to disrespect you. Can anybody testify that God has told you some things sometimes that just seem crazy? Here's what God put in my little spirit this week. 
and I'm going to give it to you. He, he asked me, who are you to assess me? <laughs> who am I, Sabrina, to assess God? Who am I to sit up here and judge God like he, he on American Idol? Who, who are you? Who are you to rate God? <laughs> who, who, who are you to appraise God? Who are you to judge God? Sit your butt down and do what he says. Period. Period. Stop disguising your no and do it immediately. Otherwise, it's disobedience. And you can hear a pin drop in here. I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> Why do you want to identify your, your proclivities, your idiosyncrasies when it comes to saying no to God? Number two, it changes the direction of your life. <laughs> Don't think you can say no to God and keep going the same way you've been going. It's all up in the text. Every time you say, saying no to God will always send you in the wrong direction. Always, always, always. Here's what I've learned about disobedience. Disobedience creates distance. Here's the thing. God is not the one who moves. You are. Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh is where he's supposed to go. It's Nineveh, 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 Nineveh. Uh, let's pretend that I'm a compass. North is here. East is here. South is here. West is here. God tells him to go to Nineveh. 500 miles northeast. 500 miles northeast. 500 miles northeast. Where does he go? He's headed towards Tarshish. 2,000 miles to the west. Going the wrong direction. You can be looking ahead, having all kinds of vision. What good is it if you're going in the wrong direction? He's going in the wrong direction because that's what saying no to God will do. Tarshish was the furthest place west that he knew. God says, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, Nineveh, please. <laughs> I wish I wished that it was that funny. I, I'm a joker, but it ain't funny. Because I know some of us have done the same thing. He didn't say it in a discourse. You don't see it in his discourse. You see it in his direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going in the wrong direction. You might be making a lot of money going in the wrong direction. You might have a few degrees, but are you going in the right direction? <laughs> you might get a nice house out of the deal, but are you going in the right direction? You might get a fly job, benefits. Are you going in the right direction? Matter of fact, that's the homework assignment. What direction are you heading? Answer that. And, and, and please be careful that you answer it too quickly, that you don't answer it too quickly? Uh, what direction are you heading? How, my, my other question is, how do you know? What's your compass? I can hear somebody saying, Keith, the word's my compass. <laughs> well, here's the problem. Man, you've taken it out of context. Here's the problem. You sitting around in your Bible study with everybody who already think like you. Everybody in your group hate Muslims. So guess how y'all gonna read the word? <laughs> Boy, y'all look quiet. <laughs> everybody in your, in your group, everybody watch CNN. So guess how y'all gonna talk about Trump? Everybody in your group watch Fox. Everybody. So guess what? When y'all study the word together, y'all going to be on the same accord even when you're wrong. They walking in the wrong direction too. <laughs> Come on, man. Let's, let's close this thing. I'm joking. Y'all see verse 3? I need you to know the Bible is brilliantly written. 
Because you know who wrote it, right? Holy Spirit. He's brilliant. Look at what he says. He says, he went down to Joppa. You think that's an accident? He, he, he went down. It also says he went down into it, talking about the boat. He, he, he went down. He went down. It sounds like Rolls Royce. Mary J. Blige, I, I'm going down. Yeah, Jonah was going down. Anytime you say no to God, your direction changes. You can't go up. You have to go down. Yeah, you're making more money, but trust me, you're still going down. Yeah, yeah, Jonah was going down. The Bible does that. It brilliantly puts that in there. Going down. I don't care. You might try to flee from God. Here's the problem. Wherever you go, you're still going down. <laughs> You're trying to trick God. You down. I'm going to keep running. I'm going to get on a boat and I'm going to sail the ocean blue. But wherever you end up, if you say no to God, you, you're going down. You're going down. And people in Nineveh need you to be up. People that don't know Jesus don't need Christians to be down. Can anybody be honest? And say, you know what, if I'm telling the truth, I'm down. And the truth is, I'm only down because 10 years ago, I said no. And I'm still paying for it. I, when I look around and I look at where I'm at, I ask myself, how did I get here? How in the world did I get here? I've gone down. I just thought it was a small no, but it's changed the direction of my life. How in the world did I get here? How in the world did I get in this state of depression? How in the world did I get here? Sometimes it's just from a simple no to God. How is it that I'm so angry? I just want to beat people. Sometimes it's just a simple no from God. <laughs> How is it that I'm just, I'm just lonely? How did I get here? Somebody can testify, it's just my no. It's just, it's just my no. I'm a long way from where I used to be. Somebody can testify that. I'm a long way from where I want to be. I'm a long way from where God has purposed me. I'm a long way from peace. I'm a long way from hope. I'm a long way from communion and fellowship. And you know what you ought to do? Can I just simply tell you? Change, change. Change directions. Hey, we don't need to wait for an altar call. Somebody maybe should do that now. You want to find out how you try to scheme on God with your no. You want to identify that because it'll change your direction. And then finally, you want to find out how your no looks because there will be disbursement. You see how the Bible again is brilliant? What does it say in verse 3? So he paid. So he paid. That's brilliant. So he paid. So he paid. So he paid. Hear me. When you say no to God, it ain't rocket science. You will pay. You'll pay. It was 1992 when that girl lied to me in the club. when I had a part in my hair. Times have changed. Here's what I know. I don't know where she is. I knew she was from Houston. I knew she went to Spelman. <laughs> was that her? <laughs> I don't know where she is today. She might be with the NFL player living in a big mansion. She might be married. She might have eight kids, all of them pretty, not one ugly. <laughs> but here's what I know. I don't know. I do know this. Wherever she is, she paid because she ain't get me. <laughs> but, <laughs> if you're visiting for the first time, I'm joking. And you know what? I'm kind of glad she didn't get me because I came out on the better end. Trust me, I had to say that. <laughs> but it's the truth. 
Jonah pay the fare. God's salvation is free. Our subversion costs. <laughs> Somebody could testify, I could have submitted to God, but I didn't. I'm still paying for it. I could have said yes to God, I didn't. I'm still paying for it. Uh, Jonah paid the fare. That means somewhere he got some money out he paid. Here's what I've learned being a Christian and saying, no, you don't always pay with money. You don't always pay with your credit card. There are six people in there. You can testify. Every time I look in my spouse's eyes, I see how I'm paying. Simply because I said no to God. I can't hardly look in my spouse's eyes. Somebody can testify. Every time I look at how far left my kids are going, some of it is a result of a price that I'm paying because I didn't do what God himself told me to do. You ain't always paying with money. Some of y'all doing well with your bank account. But you know and I know ain't no peace in your house. And I don't want that. I don't want you coming here every week out of the will of God. The factory cannot save you. Keith Norman cannot save you. It's one God. <laughs> you better do what he says. You better stop taking a poll with your friends and do what he says. Man, you better stop being weak and make it, letting your wife make all the decisions. If God told you to lead, lead. Amen. Preach, Keith. Amen. I'm almost done. But you need to identify how you cleverly say no to God. How does that look? Here's what Jonah, here's what I noticed about Jonah. We only read three verses. His no looked like this. Busyness. <laughs> He's just busy. Busy people look like they're doing something, don't they? He was busy, but that's his no. His no led to busyness. Uh, he was busy. He was busy doing busy stuff, uh, but he was purposeless. You can be busy and purposeless. Anybody in here, are you busy but purposeless? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> you at the factory every week because the factory keep you busy. You ain't got to think about your no. You ain't got to think about your problems. I, I love everybody, everybody. I want you here. But I don't want you using the factory to keep you busy if you ain't sitting at his feet during the week. <laughs> I discovered studying that Jonah, you know what it means? The name Jonah? Dove. It means dove. And a lot of this particular passage reminds me of the Adam and Eve passage. Because remember, they were trying to hide from God's presence too. Remember, they said no too, not with their lips. You remember? Jonah means dove. Remember in the Old Testament, I think it was in Genesis, I won't guess the chapter, but Noah was in the ark, you remember that? I'm going to say it again, Jonah means dove. Remember, what did Noah release from the ark? A dove. Remember the dove was flying around? Here's the problem, busy flapping, but can't find a place to rest. <laughs> Flapping, busy lifting hands during worship, but when you get home, you can't find a place to rest. <laughs> you at air Bible study, air one, flapping, <laughs> but when you get home, no peace. Jonah went into the bottom of the boat and slept, but hear me, he wasn't resting. You crazy if you think he was having real rest. Real rest can't be found if you're away from the presence of God. You better stop flapping and you better start confessing. Can I invite somebody? Can I beg somebody? Man, stop running away from God. Golly. Please. Man, I know I joke a lot, but I don't do this to get your laughter. Stop running from God. Please. Why? Man, you running away. When you run away from God, the only hope of peace you got, you leaving it. 
when you run away from God, the only security you got, you leaving it. The only joy, you leaving. <laughs> run back to him. Don't run away from him. Yeah, you said no. But, but, but he's still there. He ain't going anywhere. Y'all remember the prodigal son story? Daddy didn't leave. Daddy stayed. What if daddy had moved in that story? When boy came back, daddy gone. Can anybody testify you've run away, but when you came back, daddy was there? I was all up in the Phoenix Club, but when I got out the Phoenix Club, daddy was there. I did some crazy stuff. I seen some crazy stuff in that club, but daddy was still there. Daddy still called me. And I ain't got to be ashamed of that I used to be up in there because I'm saved. Amen. The young lady, and I won't say her name, because it probably wasn't her name. If she were to walk up in here today, I would tell her, you ain't got to tell me you sorry. I don't need your I'm sorry. You lied to me, said you were going to call me. <laughs> you took that napkin. But you ain't got to tell me I'm sorry. You don't owe me that. I, I, I'm, I'm doing all right. I got a good wife. But you ain't got to tell me I'm sorry because you told me no with your actions. But can I suggest to you, some of y'all need to tell God, I'm sorry. Some of, you, some of you need to lift your hands and say, God, God, I surrender. I ain't surrendered to you in a long time. But now I surrender. I'm sorry that I've been running my own life. I'm sorry that I've been fleeing from your presence. I'm sorry, God. That's what somebody needs to do. Somebody needs to confess their sins in this room. Somebody needs to come. Prayer team, can you come down? Elders, can you come down? Somebody needs to say, you know what? I'm tired of doing things my own way. I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. And so now, rather than running away from you, I'm going to run to you. Rather than fleeing your presence, I'm coming back to your presence. I don't want to just come to church every week and play games. I don't want to just do, I do church and mark it off of my list. No, 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 no. I want to live life on purpose. And I will not say no to you anymore. Uh, here's what I want to do. If you're a Christian, I'm talking to Christians now, and you know that you're running away from God, you know that you've told him no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make your way down and get prayed for. It ain't got to be no long prayer. Repent. Come and ask God to forgive you. Come and ask God to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what I'm talking about. You ain't got time to waste. I'm talking to Christians. Hey, 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 don't let that church person next to you stop you. They got problems too. How can you forgive me when I've often gone astray? How can you think of me when I do things my way? Turning my back from you, the one who loved me first, having my own desire. 